Hello students, in today's class we are going to learn about ecosystems. Okay, the word ecosystem itself has two parts. Okay, one is eco and the other is system. Now, what does ecosystem mean? Well, generally, if you enter a forest area or you enter any natural system or even if you enter an artificial system, you will see that there is a general mix of several different kinds of organisms ranging from microorganisms, plants, insects, birds, animals, higher animals, predators, etc. And you have the human beings such as ourselves. Okay. So all of these things are there in the natural environment wherever you see. But why are they there? And why are they so different in structure and in function? So the way in which they interact with their environment, that has to be scientifically studied. Okay. So how is it scientifically studied? We must study it in the form of a systematic interaction between living organisms such as the insects, the microorganisms, the plants, the animals and the non-living components of the environment. What are they? They can be water, they can be sand, they can be rocks, they can be the air that we breathe. All of these are non-living things. So how do the living and the non-living interact with each other and how do the living organisms interact between each other? Hello students. So, now we are going to go in depth into the area of ecosystems. I am going to spend a lot of time in explaining to you what an ecosystem means from a very basic perspective so that you will have a clear idea when we move on to more complex issues of energy transfer, biogeochemical cycles etc. Okay. So let's make it very very simple now. What do you know about an ecosystem? You just watched a very small introduction that I gave you about how organisms are related to each other or how they are related to the environment around them and how the living and the non-living interact. All that is interesting to listen. But have you really understood what I am trying to tell you? Okay. So it is very important that you understand what an ecosystem means and you should know what an ecosystem is, how it is organized so that you can not only understand the ecosystem present in nature but you can also understand the ecosystem that is all around you for example if you are in a school what is the ecosystem of the school if you are in a garden what is the ecosystem of that garden and if you are in a city what is the urban ecosystem so if you have to understand modern environmental topics it is very very important and fundamental to understand what an ecosystem is okay so let us try to understand it okay Fine. Now, if you enter into a forest, what do you see around you? You will see all kinds of animals, insects, birds, trees, plants, herbs, shrubs and the list goes on. Okay? And this is just the land ecosystem or the terrestrial ecosystem. But can you make sense of all these things? Why are they there and why are they so different from each other? and what role do they play and in what way is it related to the okay so for example and an elephant both of these are found in the african savanna but they are completely different from each other and they are both vegetarians okay and the elephant will not eat the zebra the zebra will not eat the elephant but they both eat plants and why do they eat plants is there any reason? They are very very selective. The zebra cannot eat the vegetation which is eaten by the elephant and the elephant can eat almost any kind of plant. Fine? This is more efficient in obtaining energy from the plants. And now you are going to understand what all of this means. Now let me remove the elephant from the picture and bring in the lion. Now in what way is the lion related to the zebra? Absolutely no relationship. They are both completely different. Now, let us look at a zebra and a lion. Both are present in the same environment, but how are they related to each other? Or would it be more appropriate to say, 
that they are dependent on each other. Now, taking a lot of time in explaining all these things so that you get the fundamentals correct. Okay. Once you are strong in the fundamentals, nothing can shake you. So if you listen carefully and go through my lecture slowly and steadily. Okay. So this zebra, it stays alive by eating the plant. But in order to eat the plant, it needs energy. And why should it eat a plant? It eats a plant so that the food enters the zebra. The food contains chemicals which get broken down by the digestive system of the zebra. And what happens is, very interesting thing takes place. Because of the biochemical reactions taking place inside the body of the zebra, you get the production of energy. And this energy is used by the zebra to run around, to have its food, to reproduce and to have children and to grow. And it lives its life only because it gets energy from the plants. Tell me, from where do the plants get their energy from? You know from the previous units that plants have an elaborate system of obtaining energy from the sun. Okay. The sun's photo energy will be converted into chemical energy by the plants and they are fixed in the plants as their biomass okay so the plants take part in a process called photosynthesis and they fix the energy from the sun and they put it inside their body so this is very clear to you and the zebra unfortunately does not have any pigments on its body it does not have photosynthetic pigments it is an animal so what it will do Instead of growing solar panels on its body, it will simply eat the plant. When it eats the plant and digests it, breaks it down into its individual chemicals, what will happen is, the energy stored in that plant now gets transferred to the body of the zebra. And the energy which was stored in the body of this plant is now stored as biomass of the zebra. And when a lion will eat this zebra, the energy stored in this zebra will be transferred into the body of the lion. Because the lion cannot eat a plant, but the zebra can eat a plant. Its body is designed, its teeth, its entire function is designed so that it can digest, consume plants. But the lion is designed in such a way that it can hunt and kill animals such as the zebra consume their meat and derive energy from them. That is the function of a predator. Right? So, although this looked very very childish, it is very important that you understand it. Okay. So in every environment, you have a bunch of animals which are dependent on each other for obtaining the energy to live their lives. We are also like that. I am talking right now, it means that I am getting the energy from the food that I have eaten. So, let me see, if I have had roti or if I have eaten an idli, that idli or roti comes from wheat or a rice plant which has been processed and then I am eating that, that is converted into energy molecules. I am getting the energy to speak to you right now. Okay, so, in order for an organism to live, function, reproduce and thrive, in this environment, this is otherwise very very hostile, it is fundamentally important that it locates an energy source and finds a way to obtain that energy source and fights for its right to survive in that particular environment. And once all these animals have fixed a me mechanism to survive in that particular environment, we as humans try to make sense of that. And that is what we call as an ecosystem, a systematic interaction of living and non-living things within any given environment. Okay, now if you look into your textbooks, you can find that there are two kinds of ecosystems fundamentally mentioned. They are terrestrial ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems. Under terrestrial ecosystems, you have forest, grassland and desert. Now all these three are completely different from each other. For example, if you take a forest, it receives a lot of rainfall. There are a variety of plants and animals in the forest. They are densely packed together and there is heavy competition. You will not believe me if I tell you, inside a forest there are plants with different heights, fighting for space and fighting for sunlight. Okay, so that is the struggle for life inside a forest. And depending on that plants are several thousands of small insects. Depending on those insects are birds, 
and other higher animals and the levels keep escalating till you reach a new place. In your textbooks you have two different types of ecosystems mentioned. One is the terrestrial ecosystem and one is the aquatic ecosystem. Terrestrial ecosystem basically means a land ecosystem. So whatever you see on the land, the different types of environments that you see in the land. For example, the forest which consists of a dense vegetation, different varieties of plants and animals with a good amount of rainfall, with uh, on average some good amount of sunlight, with good organic content in the soil. So all these rich things are present in a forest. And that means the ecosystem has a lot of choices and I am coming to that. Okay. Another kind of ecosystem in seen in the land or what is called as the terrestrial ecosystem is the grassland. So in grassland, the predominant vegetation is grasses, tall grasses, short grasses and uh, you will see them probably in uh, the African savanna where I just showed you some examples of the lion and zebra. Okay. So that is a completely different kind of environment. It is somewhat dry and uh, even hotter than that is the desert ecosystem. So in the desert you will know that uh, a desert is often defined like this. Uh, the rate of evaporation is higher than the rate of rainfall. Which means, more than the what rainfall comes inside the desert, the water keeps evaporating. And so there is very little water in the desert. And if at all any organism is surviving there, then they must find a way of getting energy from that particular environment and transferring it from one place to another so that different kinds of organisms can survive. So the distribution of species, the kind of species, the nature in which they are related, all these things can be studied in any given environment. So that study or that system is called as an ecosystem. So I will keep repeating this again and again so that it is very, very clear, spashta in your mind. Okay. What about aquatic ecosystems? Just like land ecosystems, in aquatic ecosystems also, you have, you have ponds which are small bodies of water, shallow bodies of water. You have lakes which is a little bit bigger than a pond and uh, you have rivers then moving on, rivers flow into, yes, oceans. And oceans, between river and ocean, there is an area where there is a mixture of salinity. Okay. So that region is called as an estuary. So you have ponds, you have lakes, you have rivers, you have estuaries and then you have oceans. In all these five aquatic ecosystems, you have different kinds of aquatic life. Okay. So there the producers are slightly different. You will have either aquatic plants or in case of oceans, very big oceans, you have what is called as phytoplanktons or zooplanktons which are the fundamental producers and the fundamental consumers also. And then the list goes on. And there the predator will be the great white shark in the ocean. Okay, so that is a simple example. And in ponds and lakes you have small fish being eaten by the bigger fish, being eaten by a still bigger fish. So basically, what happens is, there is only a transfer of energy. Okay? That is the only reason why one animal eats the other. It is not because it is having some enmity with the other animal. It is not because it is having some family problem. It is eating another animal because it needs energy. There is absolutely no other way for it to survive. So that is the fundamental reason why one is consumed by the other. What happens when everything is being consumed by the predator? How does the energy cycle back? Because according to the first law of thermodynamics, which governs our entire planet and perhaps the entire universe, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred from one form to the other. So what does this mean? The energy cannot keep on travelling like this all around. Okay? It has to come back to the producer so that it can produce everything. Not all the chemicals which are necessary for the growth of a plant are available from the sun only provides a photo energy. So there are some other nutrients such as carbohydrates, proteins, minerals, trace elements, all of these are required for the growth of the plant. And these are present in the soil. Now how do these elements transfer itself from the body of a zebra to the body of a lion and then from the body of a lion, how does it get transferred to the body of the plant? Now a plant cannot eat a lion. Okay. Huh? Can you imagine a plant hunting and eating a lion? No, it cannot. But nature has found a way to do this. How does it do it? What happens is, all the organisms eventually have to die at a certain point of time when their lifespan is effectively over. So, after death, their bodies 
will decompose in nature and it is broken down by other or specialized organisms called decompose and through the process of decomposition which again have several levels the energy which was stored in the body of the apex predator will eventually return to the soil now if it is in the land ecosystem it returns to the soil in the aquatic ecosystem also it will return to the sediment and then from there life will begin fresh so once it returns to the soil it is present as nutrients in the soil plants take up these nutrients grow and again you have the circle of life so this is how an ecosystem basically functions so any environment if it has this cyclic movement of energy then it can become established as an ecosystem so let us see what are the four functional units of an ecosystem okay so the four functional units of an ecosystem are number one it should be having a productivity okay uh, for example a lion cannot eat an insect and live a lion is a very big animal so it needs food which is equal to power all its entire body to power its muscles so a lion will need something a food which is productive to its body productivity and a lion will have to give its energy to the soil eventually so that is productivity and once it gives productivity at some particular point of time nutrient cycling it will have to give back all its biomass back to nature so nutrient cycling is important decomposition is very very important this entire cycle going through is called as energy flows those are the four functional units of an ecosystem okay so you have something which is produced and the producer by the producer the producer is consumed by the consumer the consumers have different levels primary secondary tertiary so all these things you have already learned finally they all decompose return to the primordial environment from where the cycle will start again so this is the fundamentals and you should be very very clear about this why this is taking place and each level is called as trophic level so every ecosystem has an input a transfer of energy and an output okay, so there is an input and there is an output and inside is an energy flow the output of the energy involves two things one is the entire energy is not obtained some of the energy is lost by the system so this we call it as energy loss okay the other thing is in order to return back to the environment there is some amount of degradation required okay that is one important aspect of it what are the other important aspects the levels of distribution between the organisms present in the environment whether it is vertical or whether it is horizontal is called as stratification and this particular system has to be present between the biotic and the abiotic as an interactive method what are the characteristics of a healthy ecosystem huh? a healthy ecosystem should have four or five different characteristics to qualify as a healthy ecosystem first of all there must be the conversion of inorganic chemicals to organic chemicals by the autotrophs from a radiant source of energy what is the radiant source of energy the sun then these autotrophs will have to be get consumed by consumers these consumers are also called as heterotrophs so autotrophs heterotrophs the radiant energy radiant energy autotrophs heterotrophs what happens after this the autotrophs and the heterotrophs will decompose and once they decompose what will happen the next step the energy stored in their bodies will be released and it will be recycled back into the ecosystem so this is the characteristics of a healthy ecosystem fine now we will look into a little bit of details into the process of decomposition so you have understood clearly the process of consumption and the process of assimilation of energy the transfer of energy and all these things you have understood but once all this energy is assimilated the animals have lived their life they will have to give back everything to nature so that life can start again and this is the philosophy of the environment okay so decomposition is a very very important step because it returns the complex material which is stored as organic matter the biomass it breaks it down and turns it into its elemental form nitrogen phosphorus sulfur all these chemicals so let us look at the the each of the steps involved in decomposition an organism will not say zoom shrink decompose and the organism will not decompose into its elemental form no this is not the movie this is about nature in nature the process is sequential okay so one of the first steps that is required is called as fragmentation 
fragmentation is there complex matter gets broken down into several smaller fragments and this is very very easy to understand if I take a very crude example you should not use this for the exam this is just for you to understand okay when an organism dies in the forest or when an organism dies in the open field vultures will come first and they will fragment the body into smaller pieces and then you have house flies which come after the vulture they will take away the moisture and the next set of worms will come they will also eat the body and finally the body is reduced to a skeletal form and that also eventually dissipates into calcium so this happens so how does it happen step by step so first step is fragmentation okay second step is leaching once it has been broken down into smaller parts leaching means the water soluble parts okay all that water whatever was retained as fluid matter the conversion of that water to its salt forms is what is called as leaching the liquid will leach out of the decomposing body of the organism or the plant so those are two things now what is the third thing third is where the bacteria come into the picture okay and this process is called catabolism and in catabolism the bacteria will break it down into further inorganic materials okay so that is the third step now what is the fourth step the fourth step is humification now the humus is a very dark colored or a matter organic matter which is uh, broken down completely broken down material all the flesh the skin everything the muscle the tissues all have been broken down the water has gone converted into salts and now you have the bacterial decomposition also so finally you end up with a black mass and that black mass that substance which you can see in compost okay so that is called as humus so that process is called as humification fine finally this humus is also broken down by other bacteria and that process then it gets converted to its mineralized forms its elemental forms those process are called collectively called as mineralization okay that was a very big thing to understand and i hope you will be able to remember okay so let us move on to the next step one more thing before moving on it is very very important that you should understand under what conditions can the decomposition take place decomposition is also very much a chemical process so it requires the cooperation of several environmental factors that is the climate should be correct there should be ample availability of moisture there should be the presence of microorganisms there should be a good temperature favorable temperature for decomposition the area should be good all these different things will govern the process of decomposition so there are different forms or different rates of decomposition happening in different environments you will be able to understand because in a forest decomposition is quite rapid because there are a variety of organisms that can decompose the dead decomposing tissue but in a desert or more appropriately in the polar regions where the temperature is very low it will take a very long time for the organism to decompose okay uh, decomposing uh, food chain is also referred to as detritus food chain and the decomposers are also called as saprotrophs okay so that is also an important point to remember now moving on let us go into the mathematics of energy flow okay we are not going into the advanced mathematics we are not going to go into the kinetics of energy flow but we will see some basics okay so don't worry it is quite simple to understand always remember if you understand the concept it is very very easy to remember it and once you have understood all these things about an ecosystem you will in fact love it okay and tomorrow you will be able to understand the ecosystem of your own body the microbial ecology of the body the microbial ecology in the environment all these things you will be able to finally grasp how it is related to each other and you will be able to solve problems that is also a very good important so as I told you, energy gets transferred from one form to the other. But when the energy is being transferred to one form to the other, there is a loss of energy. And this loss of energy happens from the very beginning. Because only around 50% of the light which is coming from the sun will reach and become biomass by the plant or the autotroph. So there itself there is a loss of energy. Plants are efficient. They are very efficient. Otherwise, we will not be alive today. But even they are not able to utilize the complete power being given by the sun. So, from the incident radiation, only a small fraction is taken by the plant. Used by photosynthesis, 
used for its energy generation, used for its growth and reproduction and then only some part of that energy is available in its body. For when the animal consumes the plant, the animal receives further lowered amount of energy. Okay? And then when the animal is again consumed, then even less amount of energy gets transferred. So, how can a lion compensate for this loss? You need a lot of animals. And so, nature follows what is called as a 10% law. Only 10% of the energy which is stored in an animal or an organism or in a particular trophic level gets transferred to the next level of energy transferring platform or the next trophic level. So, this is the 10% over. So that you should remember. And for an ecosystem to be healthy, for an ecosystem to thrive and to be successful in that particular environment, to be for an ecosystem, because the environment is not responsible for life. The interaction between the living things and the non-living things is responsible for life. So they have to maintain a balance. So this balance is maintained by the process of productivity. So how much energy is being transferred? from one trophic level to the other trophic level, if you are able to understand, then you will be able to understand and derive the reason for which different organisms are related to each other and which organisms are the ones which are extremely important for that particular environment. For example, in the news or in the papers, you would have seen often that this organism is a very very important organism to the ecosystem, to the survival or the existence of the ecosystem and hunting or poaching of this baboon or an unrelated monkey will create the collapse of the entire ecosystem. Why do they say that? What is the reason? Okay. So, the chain is broken somewhere. Chain of productivity, the ecosystem productivity should not be disturbed. And you should now understand fundamentally what that productivity means. There are a few terms that you should understand. Now we are going to look into ecosystem productivity. Ecosystem productivity basically means the rate of production of biomass okay, in the particular organism. Now let us go to the basics again. Suppose a plant is obtaining energy from the sun and it is converting that energy through the process of photosynthesis into its organic matter. Then the amount of production of this is called as the gross primary productivity okay. gross primary productivity that is the rough idea of the organic matter which is present as energy by the plant stored as biomass okay i hope i'm being very very clear about this it can be um, expressed in the form of grams per year per centimeter if you are trying to ascertain the productivity of a field area then grams per centimeter per year in every year how much how many grams of biomass is being produced in terms of energy, you can measure it as kilocalories. So these are different units in which you are able to measure. But here again, you have what is called as loss of energy. How do the plants lose energy? They may use that energy for some purposes. For example, the one of the most important energy losses is through the process of respiration. So respiratory loss. So gross primary productivity minus the respiratory loss of energy will give you the actual amount of energy that is available for consumption by the next level of consumer. If a plant is going to be eaten by a zebra, then that zebra will not be able to obtain all the energy of the plant. The plant's gross productivity is there. Minus the respiratory loss only will be available for the zebra. What is becoming available for the zebra as biomass is called as the net primary productivity. That is the difference between gross primary productivity and net primary productivity. And both of these are part of the ecosystem productivity. Fine? Comfortable? Okay. How will we define this uh, primary productivity? The amount of organic material which is produced by a plant through the process of photosynthesis or a given area for a given period of time in a year is called as the productivity. <laughs> okay. Now, if somebody asks you to define what is primary productivity, this is how you can say it. Okay. The rate of organic matter produced by the plant through the process of photosynthesis in a given area 
for a given period of time. So that is called as primary productivity. What is secondary productivity? There is one more term called secondary productivity. Secondary productivity is the amount of material available to the consumer. So I hope you are not confused and you are very very clear. Now we will go into the next step. So at any given point of time, the amount of material, organic material which is available for consumption in a particular trophic level, so at each trophic level, how much ever biomass is available at a particular period of time over a particular area is what is called a standing crop. Now when you say standing crop, it does not only have to do with the plants. It can also mean the amount of biomass which is available in the form of zebras. It can also mean the amount of biomass which is available in the form of insects. It can also mean the amount of biomass which is present as lions. Right? And because there is a 10% rule, and coming to that later, there is always a reduction in the number of animals as you go higher and higher up the hierarchical position of the food chain or the food web. Now a food chain is a unilinear transfer of energy from one trophic level to the other. Several food chains interconnected to each other is called as a food web. For example, you can eat chicken, you can eat mutton, and you can eat fish, you can eat egg, you can also eat a plant. Which means there are five different sources of energy coming into one single person which is you. This is an example of food web. In nature, there are several different food webs. An interconnection of several food chains comes into form of a food web. And within each food web, how the energy is transferred, that is what we are going to see next. But before we go into that, there is one more thing. Now I keep saying biomass, 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 biomass. Sir, how will you measure this biomass? Why you are not thinking of asking me? Okay. So this biomass is not measured by taking the animal and putting it in a weighing scale. It is not as simple as that. There are two kinds of weights for any given plant or an animal. It is the wet weight and the dry weight. For example, a plant is taken, in its fresh raw form, weight is taken, that is the wet weight. Then the plant is dried, a particular amount of plant is weighed and dried and then the dry weight is taken. So the difference between these will give you the biomass or the biomass can also be defined separately as wet biomass, dry biomass. So all these things are also in any given ecosystem, I told you that there is a 10% rule and that the energy is lost when you come up the higher trophic levels. And so there is some kind of an organization. That is, there are a large amount of plants, there are a fewer amount of insects, there are fewer animals which eat these huge numbers. And then at the top, there are very few predators. And nature is arranged in this way. So I take the example of this building block here. So at the bottom, the foundation should be very strong and should be wide. So these are the producers and once these producers have stored energy from the sunlight, this is the first consumer level, okay, primary consumers. Then, for example, insects, then they are consumed by the secondary consumers, for example, birds. And these birds, secondary consumers are consumed by tertiary consumers, which are the, what, predators, okay. Now, what happens is, the pyramid will get inverted at the end and you have a negative thing taking place which is the process of decomposition and finally what was once the predator turns into the biomass in the plant because the plant will take up the mineralized portion of the predator from the soil after decomposition. So this structure if you draw a shape around it resembles a pyramid or a triangle. A triangle in three dimensions is called as a pyramid. And this happens in the ecosystem. The study of an ecosystem is called ecology. So we call this thing as ecological pyramid. There are three types of ecological pyramids like this. One is the pyramid of numbers where you simply count the number of plants, the number of insects, the number of animals and you give it as a graphical representation. The second kind of ecological pyramid is the pyramid of biomass. Now I have been explaining a lot about biomass to you. So based on that category, if you are measuring the biomass and you are representing it as a graph, then the pyramid which is obtained is called as pyramid of biomass. And the third is the pyramid of energy. Okay. So there are three different kinds of ecological pyramids. 
pyramid of number pyramid of biomass and pyramid of energy okay now how does an ecosystem form tuck you clap your hands and an ecosystem is formed in the forest no it is not like that okay it is not happening at the snap of fingers an ecosystem is established over a very long or a long period of time through a series of different reactions and a series of fighting lot of fighting lot of fight for survival and many of the organisms which are present in the ecosystem have established have won their right to be in that environment at that particular point of time because of a millennia of evolutionary changes and the adaptability so that process of a sequential stages by which an ecosystem is eventually established in any given environment is called as ecological succession okay so the successive replacement of one community by the other until a stable ecosystem is formed is called as ecological succession did you understand anything that i am telling you i don't think so so let us imagine a very very plain area without any life slowly what happens there is a seed which is floating in the air and it will come and settle down now that field which should have some nutrients in it there should be the availability of some water and there will be sunlight under the right conditions that seed which has come from somewhere else will germinate once the seed germinates it will reproduce and there will be a small area covered with plants so what will happen looking at these plants and the flowers which come from these plants butterflies will come honey bees will come and in search of them birds will start coming so slowly higher and higher levels of organisms will start coming and they will start living there and as they start living there they will reproduce they will defecate and they will produce organic matter and they will die they will decompose and slowly a systematic interaction between the different things in that particular place which was otherwise a plain field is now becoming a very active environment or rather the environment is the same but what is happening in the environment an ecosystem is getting established so the first community which establishes itself to form the ecosystem is called as the pioneer community and the last community which results in the establishment of the stable ecosystem is called as the climax community it is like a movie the climax of a movie okay and in between the stages are called as seers so that is the process of ecological succession